Hi, this is Anthony and welcome back to my show. Today's video is the third comment and Q&A video that I've done on Cooper. The first couple have been very popular. As I jump right in, I hope that you'll hit the subscribe button. Comment number one, if McCoy was DB Cooper, don't you think that the crew from the original hijacking would have confirmed that McCoy was Cooper? Excellent question. And my understanding is that the FBI did show a photograph of McCoy to Tina Mucklow and she denied that Cooper was McCoy. She was the stewardess who sat next to Cooper for four and a half hours, including at times lighting his cigarettes so that he could keep his hand on the bomb trigger, supposedly. I'm well aware that eyewitnesses are not always accurate, but this is not glancing across a dark restaurant and seeing somebody for a second. This is sitting next to somebody for four and a half hours and talking to him. If she rules McCoy out, that is strong evidence for me. Is it proof? No. But it's pretty close with the lack of any other eyewitness evidence or DNA. I'll talk m some more about this in my next response. Also, my understanding is that the FBI took a long time to publicly admit or announce that Mucklow had been shown the photo of McCoy, which she denied was Cooper. Comment number two. I'm 100% sure Richard Floyd McCoy's D.B. Cooper. Why? Because all D.B. Cooper mystery fans trying so hard to convince me that he's not. With the smiley emoji at the end of his comment, I will take that, that even though we might not agree with each other, we can still be friends. I get comments literally every day saying, case closed, McCoy is Cooper. Now, obviously, the case is not closed because there's a lot of people who do not think that McCoy was Cooper and think that Cooper was another identified candidate or, like myself, I tend to think that Cooper was probably somebody who is not on the radar and likely not survived. Although I admit every time I make a video that I may be wrong about whether he survived and about whether he's an identified suspect. Just a couple comments on the topic of McCoy, which I've made many times in the past, although not everybody has necessarily seen those videos. I don't think that McCoy was Cooper because the prime eyewitness who sat next to Cooper for four and a half hours said that the man in McCoy's picture was not Cooper. I don't think that McCoy was Cooper because McCoy, who was a Mormon Sunday school teacher, was reported not to have smoked or drank. Cooper calmly smoked at least eight cigarettes while he was on board during the hijacking and left those cigarette butts behind, although the FBI seems to have lost or intentionally destroyed them. I don't buy the argument that Cooper intentionally smoked cigarettes to throw off investigators. You could fake smoke one cigarette, but you're not going to sit there and chain smoke eight. I think that if you've never smoked and you tried smoking eight cigarettes in a row, you would throw up. Also, Mucklow reported that Cooper had nicotine stan stains on his fingers, also indicating that he was a chain smoker. Cooper also had two bourbons. Again, if somebody is a devout Mormon, it's not impossible for them to drink alcohol, but extremely unlikely that they're going to be drinking alcohol to throw off investigators while they're committing a hijacking. Another reason, and this goes back to the first reason, McCoy didn't really look like Cooper. He may look more like Cooper than I look like Cooper, but McCoy was 29 years old at the time, although he looked older in my opinion. But Cooper was estimated to be between 45 and 50. Despite the black and white photos of the black and white police sketch of Cooper, Mucklow reported that Cooper had dark skin, either Mexican or Indian blood, or of Italian ancestry. Here are the FBI files on the subject. McCoy was white. Certainly that name would indicate that his paternal ancestors came from Scotland or Ireland, in particular the Scots-Irish of Northern Ireland. And by the way, if you think that perhaps his mother's side of the family had Italian, Mexican, or Native American heritage, you should note that his parents were first cousins to each other. Also, McCoy's ears stood out prominently. I read on the internet that his name growing up was Dumbo because of the ears, and while there is very little information about the sky checking that he's known to have carried out, I've read one place where it said that he wore a scarf on his head to cover his ears. Also, if you look at the photos, his eyebrows seem to be quite noticeably different from Cooper's. Of course, we can discount his larger sideburns that are taken in the mugshot and subsequent photos, as those were about six months after the Cooper skyjacking and if McCoy was the perpetrator of Cooper skyjacking, he could have let his sideburns grow out subsequently. And lastly, although there is many more reasons, 
Cooper was extremely calm during the hijacking and used a purported bomb. McCoy, by all accounts, was extremely nervous, sweating so much that his makeup that he put on as a disguise ran down his cheeks and neck onto his collar, acted erratically, and used a paperweight that looked like a hand grenade and an unloaded gun to threaten the crew. Again, if one wants to ignore all the reasons why McCoy was not Cooper, that is certainly your right, but let's do this thought experiment. Why don't you pretend that you've just come upon this case? the D.B. Cooper skyjacking, and you haven't made a decision yet, and you start learning about it, and you hear about McCoy, as you hear that information that tends to support the contention that Cooper was McCoy, compare it to the evidence that tends to exonerate or exclude McCoy from being Cooper. You don't have to tell anybody you're doing this, and you don't have to admit that you were wrong, although if you go back and watch my older videos, I thought that McCoy was Cooper after watching Dan Greider's first video. But again, like I said, people reached out to me and pointed out some flaws in that line of thinking, and I continued to research it, and I was satisfied that they're not just circumstantial flaws, they are factual flaws, and I've changed my mind. I do not believe that McCoy carried out the Cooper hijacking. Comment number three, what about the modified parachute? Here the commenter is no doubt asking about the parachute that supposedly was found by Dan Greider, in Richard Floyd McCoy's mother's barn, I believe in North Carolina, within the last few years. So I have to admit that I started watching Dan's second segment of his McCoy documentary. I've not watched the whole thing, so of course it's very dangerous to comment on something that you haven't given the time to fully research. I got sidetracked on watching some of his other videos, including the one where he talks about getting arrested. And quite frankly, watching Dan's D.B. Cooper videos is so mentally taxing where everything that is said by him or his interviewees makes me want to yell at my computer saying wait what about this wait what about that wait that doesn't make any sense i did watch his first video and at the time i was convinced that mccoy was cooper since then other people have set me straight by pointing out all the evidence that would seem to exclude mccoy as being cooper so i promise at some point i will slog through and watch the whole video so I want to be very cautious in replying to this at this point. But let me say this. One of the first things that popped out at me, if this was the parachute and harness that was used by D.B. Cooper on November 24, 1971 to jump out of Northwest Orient Flight 305 somewhere over southwestern Washington or northern Oregon or even over some part of Nevada prior to Reno, how did it get in North Carolina? I want to say, first of all, I'm not at all convinced that the shoot is Cooper's. I tried to do more research on this particular incident in the documentary. And coming upon the Drop Zone, which is a D.B. Cooper discussion website, lots of people, far more knowledgeable than me, dispute the authenticity of these shoots. Of course, they could be Cooper's, but probably not. And even though this find was featured in the documentary, there is very little, if any more, discussion about it from Greider afterwards. If this was definitely Cooper's parachute, or even likely or potentially his parachute, it would seem to me that this would be the biggest news in Cooper land besides the titanium tie, or certainly since 1980 when some of the money was found. But nearly nothing since then about the parachute. Now, I'll tell you, that I will be the first person who would admit that I'm not going to be the person that solves the Cooper case. Now, you never want to say never, but I really don't think that I'll be that person. But I will say that if I thought I found a significant piece of evidence that I truly believed was the smoking gun, I would be all over the media about it. And while Dan Greider has produced his documentaries, and they are very popular among some Cooper partisans, he really doesn't spend much time pushing this parachute discovery anymore. That aside, let's think about how the chutes get all the way out there. The crime takes place in the Pacific Northwest, and McCoy either bails out somewhere in the Pacific Northwest or somewhere close to Reno, Nevada. And under this scenario, we are to believe that he kept the parachute, but he obviously didn't keep the money. At least he didn't keep all the money because some of the money somehow ended up in the sand on Tina Bar on the Washington side of the Columbia River and was found nine years later. So, if it was McCoy, 
He either jumps out somewhere in the Pacific Northwest and seems to lose all of the money, some of which is later found. He then makes his way potentially to Nevada, which one would assume that he probably had to have taken an, another airplane. So I guess he walks to PDX, buys another ticket, probably looking disheveled, rain-soaked, and wearing mud-encrusted loafers, and carrying a parachute that he's just used to hijack another airliner, and he flies to Nevada and then goes back home to Provo, Utah the next day so that he can celebrate Thanksgiving with his family. Or else he jumps closer to Reno and then either from there heads home or goes to Las Vegas and then back up north to Provo, Utah all the while carrying a parachute that he has no need for. And then five months later, roughly, he hijacks another plane. Very little is similar other than it's the same type of plane with the aft stairs, but his behavior and everything else is different on this flight. He jumps out near his home in Provo, Utah, and then subsequently is arrested by the FBI, prosecuted, found guilty, and sentenced to 45 years in prison. I think a couple years later he escapes and ends up in Virginia, where he's eventually found by the FBI and killed in a shootout. Let's not get bogged down by the FBI shootout right now. We can maybe cover that in a future video. But after the first hijacking, the FBI searched McCoy's house, perhaps more than once, and found a lot of evidence concerning the 1972 hijacking. But eventually nothing was found concerning the Cooper 1971 incident. But where was the so-called Cooper parachute? How did that parachute get from the Pacific Northwest to Nevada, up to Utah, and then across the country, presumably after he was arrested and put into prison, and end up in McCoy's mother's barn in North Carolina? That just doesn't make a whole lot of sense at this point, especially for a shoot having belonged to the Cooper skyjacking. Why keep the evidence? No one doubts that McCoy was a skydiver. It's not unusual for him to perhaps have skydiving equipment. Maybe even some of it ended up with his mother, potentially. But I don't see any practical or logical reason to assume that this is Cooper's parachute and that it made its way to North Carolina. Again, as I've said at this point, I'll sit down sometime and watch the whole video and then probably make some type of response video to it. But I think that's enough on this topic for today. And let's remember, even though we may disagree on conclusions or even on facts, let's be civil in our discussions. The whole point of anybody interested in this is trying to come up with the undisputed perpetrator of the crime. People can often form themselves into different camps, but we need to be careful when we do this because it can blind us to the leader of that camp and turn us against equally decent researchers who favor a different suspect. So I've saved the most important comment for last. This has some very important information about certain technical aspects concerning titanium. Obviously, an important component of the contemporary Cooper research is the clip-on tie that was left behind and what particles researchers led by Tom Kay and then others have reportedly found on the tie. Certainly, some researchers believe that Particles of a certain titanium alloy are a smoking gun that connects the tie to a particular lab and narrows down to one person whom they believe Cooper was. I've, as I stated in many of my videos, I think that we need to exercise extreme caution concerning that conclusion, especially assuming that no more than eight people in the entire world would have had access to this particular alloy when I show that it, in fact, was developed at another location and there is quite likely many people throughout the world who were working on such an alloy that was then abandoned because it could not be patented and it did not seem to be commercially viable compared to other titanium alloys. And as I always mention, I'm not an expert on D.B. Cooper and I'm certainly not an expert on titanium metallurgy, but evidently this kind viewer is and sent me a lengthy informative message discussing various types of titanium. This is a comment that he left on one of my videos, so it is public to anyone who looks at the comments on that video. I don't think that he'll have any problem with me sharing it here. Because it is extremely long, I'm going to put the full text of it in the show notes. Now that my video is coming to an end, I would encourage you to read that comment and use that information as an informed filter when you're reading other information about people's interpretations of what significance particular molecules 
may have on the tie for Cooper identification. Okay, I think that's all the comments and questions and answers for today. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. I would love it if you click the like button and leave comments or questions. I really do appreciate them. Thank you so much for watching.